We don't have a textbook for this. We don't use on success or on course. or We don't use a textbook. So that's probably a big question you might have. Nope, we don't. Um, uh, this is really important. We're all open admission schools. Uh, we allow any student who tests into the level directly below our college English, although we have space limitations, so it's like first come, first serve. But we have a second level below that. That is a definitely a different population for us, and I'm sure that's a definitely different population for you. So right now, even if students come in on that lowest level and pass into the level below college, we still do not allow them to get into the accelerated program. I think that's a really important point. Um, we're, we're talking among ourselves about um, teacher recommendation for that step because we know that sometimes the testing isn't totally accurate. And so we're thinking of teacher recommendation to go into our accelerated program. But at the current time, that is not happening. Um, also, a shameless, another shameless advert. <laughs> Our Strudel's Bake Shop, I just checked, will be open at noon. Hey, if you guys haven't had these home-baked goodies, stop by and take something home. You can get sometimes a cheesecake like this for three or four bucks and they are to die for. So anyway, shameless advert. Um, I don't know if you can see this down below. There is a Baltimore conference in June. It's the fifth national one. And I believe the site is alp-deved.org. ALP uh, but you can just Google um, Baltimore Community College ALP conference and the whole program registration and everything is out there. So with that, I think we're ready to begin. Um, we use a Blackboard backup, and our colleague Rich Russell has created that from last spring, and so we have a, a Blackboard shell also created for this. Okay, so I think given all of that, we're ready to begin. I wanted to just give you a little background uh, where the ALP began, and I should also say, I forgot about this, uh, I think the designation ALP, which is not ours, and actually I'm not sure where that came from. Some people say that's a, that has a negative connotation to some people. Um, I'm fully aware of that, but I sometimes now because of that, I think it's because it's too similar to an IEP or something like that from K through 12. I'm very conscientious of this, so I have started to just say accelerated learning. I just want you to be aware of that. I, I sometimes say, yeah, this is mainstreaming students. They don't like that language either, like it's a negative. I just want to make you aware of that. Uh, so it began in 2007 at Baltimore, Community College Baltimore County. Peter Adams started this uh, program there. Uh, this June, they have their fifth annual conference. I recommend it highly. It was probably the best two days professional development I have had. It's incredibly great professional development. Uh, we began last spring, spring of 2012, with a pilot of 11 students. Of those 11, that's Jose's class. 100% completed the course and 70% returned. But of course, this is a really small sample, but I'll tell you, I've been teaching developmental for a long time. This is great. Um, we scaled up in the fall of 2012. Uh, we had one section in Cape May, uh, one in Atlantic City, and two on our Mays Landing campus. We have four faculty now, um, uh, myself, uh, Regina Van Epps, and Professor Crawford. Um, oh, I'm sorry, in the fall we also had our department chair, Jay Peterson, who was teaching in Cape May. Uh, so he was also teaching. Uh, in spring 2013, we added six sections. We're planning for the fall of this year to increase to six sections. Uh, so that's how we're scaling up, just to let you know. But, but actually, the progress from last spring to now is pretty rapid. You know, it's not like you have to spend years and years and years spinning your wheels on this. It was pretty rapid. There's a lot of support out there also. Um, we are based on Baltimore's model, but not a con copy of it. The most important concept I can tell you is this concept of backward mapping, which I had never heard until probably two years ago when I started looking into this. And I've been teaching a long time, but it makes total sense. And even in my life, I think I probably do this and never knew I did this. Um, but backward mapping, you provide students with the final assessment assignment, and then you create training wheels, I call them, to get there. 
sometimes reading training wheels to get through the reading assignment. Um, you create those training wheels to get there. So in other words, students, developmental students, come into our classrooms, they're in the 101 class, and their goal is to pass 101. So the final assessment is to write that essay at the end. That's the goal. We help them get there. Um, I, th I think this is different in developmental that I've been teaching so many years. In developmental, we were maybe teaching them to write a paragraph, then another paragraph, then join that to another paragraph. And the goal of that was to pass English 080. Now the goal, pass English 101. It's a real different approach to developmental education. Um, uh, there's that word mainstreamed again. English 080 are our students immediately below college level. That's what that means for those of you who don't have the same numbering system. Uh, they're mainstreamed into English 101 with that, we call it, and we just, this is our alpha. We need four letters in the alpha. So it's ALPS 099. That's the support class that they take. Uh, the instructor becomes the teacher, the tutor, the mentor, the advisor, and then I say, this is not for the faint of heart. We are exhausted by this time in the semester. It's a lot of energy. But I think Jose and Aquino will say they know how this goes. <laughs> they have been through this. Um, this, uh, this now, this logo, this is the Baltimore PowerPoint that I just scooped up because it's, it's what we do. Um, reduces stigma. First of all, um, there is some statistic out there. The number of students who take your placement test and when they find out they test into developmental English, they never come back. I mean, there's a really pretty impressive statistic about that part, just right there. Reduces stigma. Students know that they're not in that developmental class or whatever, they're going into a college English class, you know? So it does reduce that. Improves attachment. We already have a built-in community of learners because those students are taking two classes together from the very beginning. So that's really important. Provide stronger role model. I'll show you our, um, our model is different from Baltimore's model, but we have nine uh, ALP students in a class with 11 101 students who have been there through testing in, you know, they are 101s. So right away they have better role models in their writing and in what they're doing. Uh, encourages learning communities, that's automatically built in. I said that. Uh, changes the attitude toward the developmental course. It's no longer, why am I taking this course for no credit? It's like, this course helps me to pass that course. I will tell you that I never tell my 101 students anything about this. I never call attention to my ALP students in there. I tell them on the first day, if you want to tell somebody, you know, that's up to you. I'm not pulling you out of this class and recognizing you anything other than a 101 student. But I will tell you that sometimes a non-ALP student has overheard me talking to an ALP student and I will say something like, we're going to work on that this afternoon. And I have had non-ALP students ask me if they could sit in on this. I don't say no to anybody. They're sitting in a class that they don't have to take because they know it'll help them with something they need. It's like, it has been the best shot in the arm for me as a long-term educator. It has been really the best shot in the arm for me because I have students who want to be there and know that it's going to help them. W way different from the other developmental model. Um, allows individual attention. Uh, I see these students four times a week. Um, Oh, the non-cognitive issues. Uh, my colleague Regina is going to point out how important affective issues are in this. The affective is critical to this. And I think that, that gives me a shot of energy also because for a time period here, we were saying, hey, don't worry about affective issues. We've got to get these stats. You know, you can't put stats on that. And I, I'm so encouraged by my guru, Peter Adams, who says, don't worry about that. You need this affective. Um, allows coordination of the two courses. Uh, this is Peter's model. He just has one English 101 section. I hope I don't go too fast through this because ours is really different. 
He has a 101 section with um, 10 students and 10, as you can see, the English 101 and the ALP. And then he meets directly after class with a class of 10. All right, that's his model. Um, our, uh, this is his, his slide again, difference between ALPS and traditional. I already said that. Goal of traditional is for students past developmental. Goal of an ALPS is to help students pass college English. If I'm going too fast, you'll just have to put up your hand. Um, the goal for an ALPS professor is to maximize the ALPS student's probability of success. Uh, we, c we do many things. Conduct classes of writing workshop, extension supplement to 101, answering questions left over from the 101 class, uh, providing opportunities for more writing practice, short papers to reinforce concepts. Uh, we do some in-class writings, and then when I get them back to them, they're low-risk, um, formative assessment papers. And then I give them back to them and say, you know, some of you might want to use these in your paper for 101. You know, it's a summit. You could use that in your summative assessment in 101. Um, we brainstorm ideas for the next essay, preview drafts, work on reducing s the error problem, uh, and address non-cognitive life issues, affective issues. Uh, sometimes we have some tears. Um, we don't solicit personal information. Sometimes it happens. And we are ready to just sometimes have a heart that listens. And I think that's really important for our students. Uh, ours is different in many ways also because unlike Baltimore, we have a, a large technology component. We require our students the second class of the week, or I think it's the second class of the week, all students go to a computer lab. The ALP students go to a computer lab. So we think that that's really an important support. Active learning is really built in automatically to that. Sometimes in the computer lab, they're working on their drafts for the class. Uh, I will be honest, sometimes they'll come in and say, I have a paper due tomorrow in psychology. Could you look it over? You have to be ready to drop at a moment's notice. I mean, there's not like a standard day-by-day -day curricula because it's fluid. It's very fluid. Supporting the needs of the students is very fluid. But we also, these are some of, the, some of them. Thesis Builder, Night Sight, Turnitin, they all have to use Turnitin, Blackboard, Web Advisor. We teach them some of the email strategies and the college website strategies that they don't know. It pulls them into the college from the very first week or two that they're here, because these are first time, full time students. Uh, the college website navigation. We receive mid-semester progress reports from faculty, and we hold individual conferences with all of our ALP students at mid-semester to see how they're doing in their other classes. Sometimes they're quite surprised because um, they'll say to me, I'm not doing well in math. I think I'm going to have to drop out of math. And then we get the, the paper back, and it, sa it says, do you think the student should drop out? And the check mark is question is checked no. And I say, come on, just keep with it. Go to the math tutor. You're going to make it. You know, you're going to make it through this math class. So we're involved all across the spectrum, really, not just English class, you know. Um, now, this is what we do. This is how we are so different just in the structural part of it. And I think I came up with this. I do. I mean, I had been partnering with Peter and what he was doing in Baltimore. But for some reason, I thought maybe, well, here was what it was. I was afraid that having 10 students in a class would not be acceptable. I'm sorry, I'm a taxpayer too, you know? And you think, whoa, somebody's going to say, we're not going to do 10 students in a class. Well, our developmental class size is set at 18. So I've been doing that for a long time. So I thought, OK, let's look at a different model. So this is our model. Our English, we, we model it with two English 101 classes. So it becomes kind of like a set of three three-credit classes in one group for the faculty member. OK, so it's one group. So in our English 101, we still have 20 students, but we have 11 who are in there as 101 students. And then we have nine um, who are ALP students. 
And then we have another one, usually the same day, but not always the same day. And then the ALP students meet together from these two groups into a support group of 18. That's how ours different, differs. Um, I, I, I should say this. I think that um, the lack of stigma and the psychological support in all of this, I said, I don't tell my students, I don't tell my 101 students, oh, by the way, we are being joined by some nine students who are experimental students who really didn't test in here. I don't say that ever. These students are all 101s. When I meet with them individually, I say, I'm not going to tell anybody who you are. If you want to tell somebody who you are, that's up to you. To me, you're all 101s. I have found from the very beginning that these students hardly ever forget to do their homework. I think they're afraid to be called on and someone says, what are they doing here? They didn't read the assignment or they don't know what's going on. I find my ALP students even more motivated in the 101 classroom. For that reason, I think it's a psychological, a really great psychological boost. So this is how we do it. Uh, this is a difficult <laughs> item to schedule, but we're working on it, you know, we're working on it. Uh, this is ours. Students take their developmental writing course concurrently with the credit level. The same instructor, I think this is crucial also, the same instructor teaches both the ALP course and the credit course, um, at least half. Um, are placed into a credit level writing. Um, Non-COG issues, I'll allow Regina to do that. Um, the pedagogy is based on this backward design, um, emphasizes active learning. It's very active learning strategy. Sometimes we have to create those training wheels over the weekend. Um, improved reasoning skills, engaged reading, and more effective editing skills. Um, I will tell you that I think in some ways after all these years it has made me a little more focused for all of my 101 students. Um, uh, we are reading four books this semester in 101. We don't have a, I don't like the typical anthology. So we're reading four books, two nonfiction, two fiction. We're into our fourth book right now. Uh, and last semester I chose a nonfiction book, Lives of a Cell by Lewis Thomas. I loved the book. Ten years ago my students loved the book. Right? I chose the book. Second day into the class, my students, who feel comfortable enough with me, I guess, they're all saying to me, this book's too hard for us. This book's too hard for us. I thought, whoa, this book's too hard for you. I didn't say to them, oh, well, then let's just forget it. We're going to move on to something else. Oh, no. I said to them, I've got a lot of work cut out for me this weekend because I have to create some strategies to help you read this book. That's not on the internet. That's not in the book. You have to create strategies to go through those essays and to help them come to the point. And then after that, many of them said, I really like this book. You know, they couldn't get to that at first. But we don't give up. We just create those strategies for them. And I think the backward learning design also is just critical. And I'm a person, I'm never late. I was thinking of this. I'm never late to any place because I do a backward design in my head. I have to be someplace at 8 o'clock. It takes me an hour to get there, an hour to get dressed. I better come off the beach at 6 o'clock, you know? I mean, I do backward design automatically in my head. Um, okay, so compared to the traditional, and again, we have probably fewer than 100 students so far because we're just in our third section of this, doubles the success rate. And, and this is also with Peter's uh, six years of statistics, and he has thousands of students in his statistics. I don't have his statistics with me. I do have all of his PowerPoints. Doubles the success rate, cuts attrition in half, does it in half the time at slightly less cost per student. I don't have time to show you the cost savings slides that are up there, but he works it on faculty credit hours and the savings on faculty credit hours to do a very successful program. It's amazing. Um, this is, uh, well, maybe Matt can help us. I believe, that, I believe that this is just spring when I had 11 students. I believe that's what this is, spring last year. And the, I didn't have any 
D, F, W, or N, A. I had none of those in my 11. This is Jose's class, I guess. This is Jose. <laughs> I don't know what Jose got. I can't remember, but he was up here someplace. <laughs> Aquia is saying, are you going to show my grade? No, I'm not going to show you grade. Um, and then I believe this was uh, fall. This must have been fall grades. So yeah, this would have been fall grades. Um, last fall. And last fall we had four sections, so we were up to about 80 no, 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 students. I'm sorry. It is the same, it's the same oh. group of students. It's just comparing them against two different groups. Um, the first group is the people who took English 101 with the Alps students right. who placed into the same level of developmental. Mm -hmm. And then the bottom graph is the pool from which the Alps students were pulled. So these are students who placed into 080 and who took 080 and passed out of 080, and this is their performance within English 101. Right. I'm going to move along. And if you have more questions with Matt, you can ask them. And this is just from the second semester, and you can see that the out is, even though we lost students with our 80 maybe that we were working on, um, that it still outperformed the other traditional models that we have with, with our statistics that we have. I think comparing 11 students to 500 or something is like comparing apples to donuts or something. I'm still, I'm moving on. <laughs> I'm moving on. Um, uh, we, we were part of a scaling innovation grant. Um, for sake of time, I'm going to get rid of this. Uh, we did have a grant with um, CCRC, uh, Community College Research Center. Um, but this is different pyramid structure, class size 18, 20, increased use of technology. I already spoke about that. Um, frequent comments to me, it's just embedded tutoring, or you must be watering down your class. And I'll just tell you, we are all reading four books. We read four books last spring. We read four books last fall. <laughs> here are my, here are my, um, my testifiers who can say, yes, yes, in this class we read four books. I, I choose two fiction, two nonfiction. I, ch I try to choose around 200 pages. This semester we started with The Alchemist by Paula Coelho. Students take to that like a duck to water. They love that book. Uh, then the nonfiction this semester was a David Sedaris book. Then the fiction we went back to uh, was The Road by Cormac McCarthy. And the one we're finishing up right now is um, Han, who is a Buddhist monk. And it's all about meditation, which we all need at this time of the semester. It's called Pieces Every Step. So we read four books. They write four papers. The final exam for everybody is create a thread that ties all four books together. And I say there's no right or wrong answer. You just create a thread that ties all four books together, and that's your final exam. And I get some really creative papers from that one. OK, sorry, I'm almost done. Uh, what keeps us up at night? Class size, is it too many? We still don't know. Do we have too many? Peter says, you're crazy for doing that many. We don't know. Um, assessment, uh, that's another question. Scaling up, fast or slow, advising faculty technology, students who fail apps but pass their English 101. I'm not sure that we've had that too much. I personally have not had that happen to me. But I've heard other schools have that sometimes, uh, keeping it fresh, finding credentials fa faculty. I think all across the board, this is going to be very difficult because typically some s colleges use um, BA faculty to teach developmental classes. And of course, this would require a master's level faculty to teach the courses. So I think that's going to be a challenge scaling up. And this is my uh, email address. This is Peter Adams' email address. And if you have any questions of them, that's great. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's mine. Mm -hmm.